Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here with um, Arthi Narinam, uh, an innovation leader at Genentech. Uh, and we're going to be talking about PAT, artificial intelligence and machine learning in bioprocessing and its use in intensified processes. Thank you, Arthi, and welcome. Thank you, John. I really appreciate the opportunity um, to share perspectives on the topics that you just mentioned, PAT, AI, Great. ML, all of which are close to my heart right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny. I mean, we're going to be talking about this. And I remember 20 years ago, I was working with artificial neural nets in fermentation prediction and so on. And could you just sort of say to, to level our audience, what, what are the type of technologies used when we talk about AI and ML? What, what, what's happened in the last 20 years? Has it moved on from neural nets? Can you give a description of the status of that kind of technology? Definitely. Um, very happy to speak about it in the way that you know I understand it right now. I would say that AI, ML, um, th these are big words, right? Artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, machine learning, modeling, they're all different tools. And in the biopharma industry, I would say we're still barely scratching the surface. Uh, in terms of maturation, it's gotten very far ahead in the enterprise learning um, resource industry as well as hospital industry. However, in our biopharma with manufacturing and development, we're still in infancy. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a novel technology. We can use it as a predictive tool, and that's why it falls under the PAT realm. And uh, we're learning. We're just starting to learn. I right. Would say. And, so, and, and so this is, I mean, it's a hot topic in the industry. There's lots of AI companies. We're sitting here in South San Francisco. It's great to be in person, um, surrounded by you know, all, all, all the tech companies. And, and I guess we are a little late to the party in this area, but we are science driven. But I think what would be useful is also to look and say, what's the eventual goal, right? It's not quite a normal sensor. What's the kind of outcomes that you're expecting to achieve in the next five years? Um, I think of, you know, sensors which might reduce human interaction or reduce sampling and so on, which are, are very pointed things. Can you talk more generally about what does success look like in the next five to 10 years if um, if progression occurs at the rate we would like? Absolutely. I think in order to, maybe we should just take a step back first mm -hmm. and um, establish some con context here. Um, I would say you got to dream big, right? And right. <laughs> Um, in the world of antibodies, I mean, we gravitated from small molecules into antibody production. Somebody somebody made a switch there, right. right? Somebody dreamt big. So now in the field of PAT, I mean, we have come a long way from having manual counting, and then mm. we proceeded to using offline instruments, and then we had online sensors. And over the 20 to 30 years now, we've built a lot of data, right? right? So data is our power. Data is the power. Yeah. That's a nice phrase. Yes, data is your gold mine. Um, so now that we have so many molecules in the pipeline and we have rich data coming out of the various development and manufacturing sites, this is the time to start investigating into these novel technologies. Where can you see? Can you use all this data that you have and see whether we can build models that can predict and give us a peek into the future? So I would say when I say dream big, it's like right now. The current state is you have pilot plans with labs where you run studies for tech transfer. Can we get to a zero study tech transfer? Right. Can we get to rather than having pilot plans with labs and equipment infrastructure, can you have your pilot service stations, right? You're going to need a lot of computing power now right. with these models, just building models, maintaining them, sustaining them. It's going to take a lot of infrastructure. They go hand in hand. So, um, I mean, the end goal or the, the blue sky there is to have these predictive models, but how do you get there, right? We need a roadmap. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to jump to a little, a little gold mine that I think people always kind of say is, does this mean you think these models will be predictive enough that you can get to real-time release or use it in some closed loop automation? Is that, is that near term? Or is that still that blue skies far away? I think that's fairly near term. That's not your moonshot. Right. Okay. Definitely. I mean, the there should be if you have a robust model that can do a good job predicting your product quality attributes or your key process uh, parameters, key process indicators, then real time release is not too far out there. 
Um, and to your earlier question on can we enable um, less human sampling, less human intervention, that is the goal, right? So I don't think those are moonshot, uh, but again, um, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, right. right? So if you don't try, you'll never know. So when you, when you go about this and within Genentech, obviously you're, you're, you're a leader pushing this forward. When is the right time to start implementing either the, the data gathering? I mean, that's happening all the time, but when you, you, you take these methods of AI, is it right at discovery? Is it early stage post development? Or is it really when you've got a pile of data, phase three and late, that you can properly leverage? When is the right time to start? Right, that's a great question, John. We've been thinking about it as we are uh, moving forward with this initiative ourselves. And as I said, it, this technology is still in its state of infancy. Now, there's a long way to go in terms of shopping it around and getting approval with the regulatory agencies, for example, right? So I would say right now we are in the proof of concept stage. And so where would I want to invest or put my money? I would say let's put it in the manufacturing um, environment. Why? Because that's where you have the power of data, right? As I said, data is your gold mine. In development, you're still probably talking about, you know, batches that you can count in your fingers as opposed to sitting on thousands of batches of data in manufacturing. So I think in order to for us to go from POC, the proof of concept to the pilot stage and to build confidence in the mm. robustness of these models, the consistency, how can I predict? Can I predict across molecules? Can I predict across sites? There's a lot of questions that we need to answer here, right? So I, I think you're safer to start in the manufacturing. Right. Yeah. And and I guess one goal of that is you're you're looking to improve the manufacturing outcome. That's right. right? This would be either to uh, get less variability, to have some um, economic gain. Yeah. But that's that's the goal. absolutely better control. Better control. Right. Less deviations. Um, less human intervention. Potentially less labor. Right. Right. And faster. Can you get faster to the market? It's uh, time is money so all, here. All of that comes to, in fact, the, the, the goal of these sessions that Absolutely. we're talking about, which is intensification of uh, accelerating those type of processes through the facility. You spoke about that in tech transfer. That's super interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Now my brain is catching up a little bit with, with yours. You, if I go back to that, you actually think you could build that model of manufacturing and then as you develop your process coming through, you know how it's going to fit, Correct. shortening that time of tech transfer. That's, Absolutely. That's, a, that's a key identified kind of goal. Right. That's if you have n number of days right now that it takes for you to do a tech transfer from one site to another, can you cut that by half? Can wow. you cut that by one third right. by developing these predictive models where you actually don't have to do studies, but you just have model based tech transfers? Right. Wow. That is a great goal. So I can imagine one key element to this, of course, which is always the case, is humans, right? Yes. So you've got humans, you've got to train them, not just in this, say, the development of this model, but the, the acceptance of the technology and the trust that you can eliminate these stages, right? Yes. Um, how, do you, how do you go about that? What is your experience telling you that the pathway along this road leads? Yeah, I'd be very honest with you. It's not easy, right? It's not a bed of roses <laughs> that we're going to be walking on. It takes a different mindset. Um, it's a it's a shift in the mindset because you you got to now start thinking differently in terms of even the talent that you're hiring, right? In the past, if you had your lab full of technicians and technical specialists that were very hands on and running your bioreactors, now you need people that can build models that need that understand programming, that understand the nuances of machine learning, deep learning, and what's out there, right? I mean, th that industry is rapidly evolving. The model that I used three months ago has now become something else, right? So can I apply that? Am I going to get better accuracy? Um, and the biggest scouting right now that we're doing is where is a model that can get us the best accuracy with minimum data? Right. Because we're not in the tech industry or we're not doing advertising, right? We're not gathering data from millions. We do have thousands of batches, but still can we do with less? So can, can we have a more powerful model with less data? So you got to really think differently as leaders now. What kind of skill sets do you need? What kind of infrastructure, systems infrastructure, data acquisition? Right now, it's fairly manual. How can you automate that? Right. Right. And um, the tech <laughs> giants have come a far um, distance here. Yeah. And we're just starting. So there's a lot to do. So, that, so that, that talks to something else, which is 
hiring the right sort of people. Right? Absolutely. And mostly we're talking about, you know, historically biologists. Now you're wanting to essentially take people with skills in Google and Apple and and and, and other places, but they would often lack the biological. Absolutely. Knowledge. So how do you manage the integration of these two teams? One who's you know more biological, one who's more mathematical, um, and, and techie. That's got to be an interesting dynamic as you build this team. Absolutely. Again, a great question here. We need a good mix, right? We need a good combination of folks that have process knowledge as well as the modeling skill sets. So it's like mm -hmm. biology with data science. And I'm really uh, happy to see that there are schools right now that are offering majors, right? This is, um, again, for, for folks that are pursuing college degrees, you know, you can mm. do chemical engineering with data science. Right. You can do computer science with a, you know, bioinformatics minor, things like that, so that you have a balance of both. Right. Um, in the meantime, I think um, the way we'll have to manage is through our workforce, we'll have to have a good hybrid of programmers and the traditional chemical engineers so that one can teach the other. Yeah. So it's like um, it, it's a you know three prong uh, approach here. Right. You know, buy, borrow, uh, build. <laughs> okay. Right. You, you yeah. I mean, you borrow skills like where you sort of outsource and have a contracting workforce, and then you start building your in-house talent. Um, Excellent. So, yeah. in in that development, one one thing I'm kind of surprised about is there is not so many supplies in this area. When you think about sensors and the whole PAT. There's a whole realm of suppliers that came up with amazing innovations, some of which now are being implemented in manufacturing, and this is fantastic. But in this area, it seems, you know, there are some consultants, but there's not really a raft of companies which you can phone up and say, have you got some models? You right. Know, people with um, Raman instruments. Yes. It comes, of course, with the computing and some some sort of pre-built models, but, but they're really always going to be modified. Yeah. And the supplier is, you know, maybe a little bit more distant than historically they have been. Why is it that suppliers don't exist here that can come off with an off-the-shelf model and say, I built up digital twin, I built an intensification strategy for your tech transfer? Where will those suppliers exist? If there's a reason why those suppliers won't exist? I think they're starting to exist. It's a journey that's just started. So I think we'll have to give it some time. We will get there. Part of the problem is the suppliers don't know what the end user wants, right? They don't quite understand our business. These small uh, companies in the AI ML, they, they don't know. I mean, it's an aha moment for them. I've been talking to a few and they're like, oh, oh, is there a business case for our models in your industry? And I think it's a two way street. We got to educate them just as yeah. much as we want to you know, gather their expertise. It's also a matter of teaching them, hey, this is what we're looking for and this is the power that you guys offer. Um, so it's a two-way street that we need to start developing connections and, um, you know, giving a hand. So so one of the fascinating pieces, of course, you said at the beginning, right, you know, data is, data is the power, data is the gold mine. But pharmaceutical companies are renowned for really hanging on tightly to that data and not sharing it. How's that going to work if you involve suppliers where they need to get into that data to start validating the models and building new models? Is that going to allow, is that required or are you going to just bring the technology off the shelf or are you going to have to start opening up to the suppliers and sharing data? We have, you know, different agreements that we can work with the suppliers with, like there is confidentiality disclosure agreements that we can sign and we can uh, definitely get them to start building models with our data. Right. Um, so there are, there are ways to protect our data. And I'm not saying we'll completely outsource. That's where I use the terminology of buy, build, and borrow. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a short term when you leverage these external vendors or smaller companies to build models for you. But the end goal should be biopharma, just like the development and manufacturing is our bread and butter, we'll have to integrate the AI ML into our bread and butter as well. Right. You know, and, and, and sort of to, to finish off this, we spoke about um, the implementation and the tech transfer and the manufacturing, I think people are going to think, well, what do the regulatory agents think about this? How do they feel about maybe it's a black box model, maybe it's a more mechanistic model, maybe, you know, what transparency do they need to feel confident in this? And how do you go about interacting with them to make this a reality? Yes, that's a great question again. 
this is a process of evolution. I would say, you know, 30 years ago when we launched our antibodies, we were counting cells manually, <laughs> right, with hemocytometer. And that's how we filed the processes then. Then came along CDEX and Vicel, and we were able to validate and present it to the regulatory agencies. And they looked at the data, they looked at the robustness of the technology, and they approved processes mm -hmm. with those offline instruments. And then you have the online sensors. Now you have inline Raman probes, and regulatory agencies are also evolving with these uh, technologies, right? So I think again with AI ML, it's it's about us again proving the robustness of this technology, which is now in in its in infancy. So the more we can uh, move forward and show that these models are promising, they are accurate, um, they have good specificity, they have good consistency and robustness, I don't see why they would not accept it. But there's work to be done. There's, there's, there's work to be done. I think that's fantastic. I think the, the more people get into it, of course, the Correct. more data is produced, the more uh, likelihood it is that it gets accepted and then uh, regions get comfortable with that. I, I, I think it's been fascinating. I'm super happy to have been here. Thank you very much, Arthi, for this uh, time. And um, hopefully there'll be questions in the forums coming up uh, later in the, uh, I'm gonna start in, in the show. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. It was a pleasure speaking with you. So, Arthi, uh, fascinating talk with you today. Thank you so much for your time. Um, have you got any, what, what is a, a parting thought or a, a message you'd like to convey to the audience as you kind of sum up your thoughts in this area? Absolutely. We don't want to be a lone soldier in this journey. Right. Um, I think it's going to be far more fun and exciting if we can join hands with the rest of our industry peers and work on this technology and uh, take it towards regulatory approvals. So the more so the merrier is what you I want, would say. want people to join in. You need, I guess, an industry consortium, right. things like this to start establishing standards and um, um, methods of practice that Absolutely. can be copied across the industry. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time, Arthi. It's been fantastic to talk and uh, uh, back to us at the show and we'll have some questions later. Thank Thanks. you very much. Bye-bye. John.